Hello and welcome to Hello, This is the Doom Show. I am Richard. Folks, it's another solo episode. As promised, I am too lazy and tired to edit the frickin' proper episodes which I have recorded, which feature uh, my lovely co-hosts Brad, Jeffrey, and Simon. And instead, I am burdening your ears, or am burdening your ears with my voice in the solo form. But uh, yeah, this is... The, the last episode of 2020, uh, and then uh, things will get back to normal in January. Hopefully we'll hit the ground running, and I'll get some more of the content you expect, and less of me, which you do not like. I know. It's okay. Uh, let's see. Few fun things before we get started. I did a guest spot on a, a podcast called It Came From The Shed, and uh, Goose and Siege... Uh, invited me on their show, and it was really fun. So look for it came from the shed, and look for me. <laughs> I called the episode Broma of Souls. If you look at the artwork for it, you'll see why I called it that. If you were one of those people with heads of metal, metal heads. Um, I've also been on a couple of episodes of uh, the podcast Under the Stairs with Duncan McLeish. Uh, we were talking about a very certain filmmaker. Uh, that uh, is is wonderful, and I'm not going to say what it is. You got to go look for it. So the podcast under the stairs, and look for my guest spots. So what is this episode about? Um, this episode is my birthday episode. Happy birthday to me! La 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 la. la. Just kidding. It's not my birthday. I was going to do this in August, and now it's December because who gives a shit? <laughs> you know, we'll do this when we do this. Uh, but I really wanted to talk about movies from my birth year. If you are a person who was born and likes movies, please look up the movies from your birth year. It is so fun to just figure out what was going on in the world as well as what was in the popular imaginations of you know creatives. And of course, you know, since I was born in August, I was probably conceived in December because, you know, it was Montana, people were cold. People got to get it on to stay warm, so here I am. Anyway, <laughs> let's not think about that too much. Uh, I like to look at like what was freaking in theaters while I was in the womb. Also, if you think about it, a lot of these movies were being made before 1976, so their connection to the year 1976 is just their release date. Uh, because IMDb is really reliable, and Wikipedia is also... Well, Wikipedia is more reliable than IMDb. A lot of these things slide around, so some of the things I'm going to talk about in my birth year are going to be movies that might make you go, that's not 1976, oops, spoiler alert, what are you doing? So I'm going to try, I, I did try, to, to keep it real and actually have movies that did come out in 1976, but I don't care, it's fine. Who? I don't even know if I was born. Is this real? 1976 is when it happened. <laughs> the magical event. <laughs> that is me. Uh, so we're going to go into all these 1976 movies. And uh, luckily, uh, some of you folks out there contributed. And we'll get to a segment later where uh, we read their favorite movies from their birth year. It's going to be great. So I'm going to drop this little intro in and uh, we'll get started. This is a CBS News special with CBS News correspondent Walter Cronkite.
Good evening. On this July 4th, 1976, 1976, 1976, 1976, 1976. So in my book, uh, Doomed Movie Thon, um, who else here is surprised that I'm plugging my book during all this crap? So yes, Doomed Movie Thon by Richard Glenn Schmidt, available at Amazon.com. Um, I have in it chapter six. There's a little thing called the Spirit of 76 Movie Thon. And here's how it starts. In the summer of 1976, when I was two weeks old, men in black cloaks came to take me away. My family was living in Great Falls, Montana, when one afternoon someone banged at the front door. My mother answered with me in her arms and asked these mysteriously garbed individuals what they wanted. They told her they had come for her son. Frightened but headstrong, my mother held me closer and told them to leave immediately. Perhaps it was something in her eyes or her voice that stole their resolve, but the men in black cloaks quickly retreated from the yard. Only feeling safe after she had shut and locked the front door, my mother looked at her son and realized that he was something special. So, that's a story my mother tells. She swears it's true, um, and I don't know what it means or what was going on, although it was Montana, so God only knows what cults uh, were operating there at the time. Probably something nefarious. <laughs> or just ne fucking awesome But anyway... In the book, I do uh, quite a few movies. Shout out to my dearly departed friends, Nafa. Nafa showed up on that one. And of course, uh, my friend Shelly, uh, also rest in peace. They both showed up and hung out and watched some really, some real humdingers, uh, which we'll get into. <laughs> some of these movies uh, made it to my list of uh, favorite 1976 movies. Uh, the one that didn't make it is Naked, Ma Naked Massacre. Um, I freaking hate Naked Massacre. Uh, really depressing version of the uh, Richard Speck murders, which of course the Richard Speck murders were depressing. But just the movie was just really unpleasant. So, bleh. so yeah, check out the book if you're feeling it. Of course, it's on Amazon. It's cheap as hell. Uh, buy it for a friend and they can uh, donate it. So like I said, uh, you should really celebrate the films of your birth year. They are wonderful. I personally was a bicentennial baby, as my mother called me. I was not born on the 4th of July uh, because my voice cracked because Credence Clearwater Revival. Uh, but I was, you know, in that time of celebration uh, when America was 500 years old, because bicentennial, as you know, means 500. And man, it was a weird year for cinema. Um, it was, this is a lot to unpack here. For horror, this was a post Texas Chainsaw Massacre year. This was a pre-John Carpenter's Halloween. It was also pre-Alien. Um, so you didn't get a lot of Italian rip-offs of things like Alien, which you got in the 80s. Um, you didn't have all the slashers yet. I mean, there was obviously um, some very slashy movies that were out, uh, but they weren't um, you know, formulaic yet. The, John Carpenter hadn't accidentally started a trend with his stuff. Now, what I really find interesting about this is that it was a post-Jaws year. So the blockbuster movies were coming. That that era of, which is still not over, of just these, these big uh, tentpole releases. I'm probably stealing that phrase from somebody. Thank you, person I stole that from. They were just huge, huge, huge things. Uh, so this is pre-Star Wars, so Star Wars hadn't dropped yet, which I find really interesting because, of course, Star Wars would change the entire frickin' uh, drive-in circuit and just, just filmmaking in general would be forever altered. Popular filmmaking would always be different after that. So it's really interesting time. Uh, 1976 is, is gr it's a gritty, I'm going to put this word in quotes for you, sexy. Uh, this is a wannabe sexy year. So people were trying to be, I guess like porn chic had kind of come and gone with uh, whatchamacallit, deep throat. So I think people were still wanting to make sexy stuff. So there's, there's like weird porn <laughs> I came out in 76, maybe every year as weird porn. Maybe I won't even go there, but uh, yeah, it's just, it seemed to reflect this, this attitude of the time captured very well by a, a something like 
uh, Taxi Driver. Uh, what year was um, Hardcore Movie? Was that? Was that 79? What was that? Yeah, 79. The one with, uh, what's from who's it's uh, George C. Scott, where he finds out his daughter's a porn star, <clears throat> which is now just a meme because the world is a meme. But, uh, you know, 1976, people were still maybe romanticizing that industry a little bit. I don't know. Anyway, uh, speaking of hippies, this is the, this is the hippie leftovers where a lot of the summer of love shit, of course, was over and uh, these hippies were facing the cold, cruel reality of, you know, how can I get into the stock market? How can I live forever and, and ruin social security? Whoops, I have no opinions on that. They also brought us the frickin' me generation. Oh my god. So many 70s movies have the dialogue. I love the dialogue where people are trying to find themselves, um, ex explore each other's uh, personalities and their love vibes. Like, just that shit where... They were done saving the world, and now it was time to party. But they wanted to do it in a very self... They wanted to examine themselves with a mirror. You know, you put a mirror on the floor and you stand over it. No, wait, what? No, I just I just love Me Generation dialogue. Um, there's a film that was released in 79. It almost made my list, but I'm trying to figure out when it came out. Called Savage Weekend. I love Savage Weekend. Brad and I talked about it. And we sampled some of the dialogue from that freaking mess. And it's just so funny. I love that stuff. Anyway, I'm on a tangent already. But yeah, this this is what I, I mean by looking at the year you were born. Like, I would have never known about all this crazy shit that came out. Uh, you know, look beyond things like Rocky and The Omen. And like, those are neat, I guess. I, I couldn't sit through Rocky right now if you paid me. <clears throat> I'm, well, you know what? Give me money. I'll watch Rocky. How about that? But I'll give you the, your money back because I don't want to watch it. To look beyond the, the, the popular stuff and try to find the really weird, weird stuff that you didn't even know existed, much less came out the year you were born. <laughs> and ask your parents, like, yo, mom, dad, you know, I know you guys were boning in that theater the night I was conceived. What were you watching? Don't ask them that. So I'm going to go through the boring stuff. And I'm by boring, I mean... Y'all who listen to this show, all two of you, probably don't want to hear me talk about, like, the important quote-unquote movies from that time. I mean, maybe you do. So, here's my non-horror list. I, I thought, as I was making this list, I was really self-conscious, like, this is so boring. Who cares? <laughs> I'm writing this stuff down. These are good movies I appreciate um, from the year 1976. First up, uh, Chinese Roulette. From uh, Raina Werner Fassbinder. Um, is it Werner or Werner? I'll never know. Um, Chinese Roulette really caught me off guard um, because that may have been my first of his movies. And it's something else. It's very, very... Um, it's a, I almost had a thinking movie. It's a thinking movie. It's real cerebral. It's all about dialogue. And uh, yeah, it's it's something else. I've I've seen two of his movies and I really enjoyed them. I for some reason I'm hesitant to watch more. What was the one where the uh, the lady is a she's a woman? I don't know. I watched two of them anyway. <laughs> oh, Fastbinder. So uh, the killing of a Chinese bookie, directed by John Cassavetes. I hesitate to call it a phase because uh, that sounds like I'm uh, like down talking down. Uh, but I did go through a, a Cassavetes phase where I watched. You know, the big ones of his movies. I certainly didn't watch everything. I didn't see love streams or anything. I watched all of his stuff. And uh, the one that really kept me coming back for more was uh, The Killing of a Chinese Bookie. That's a fine, fine film. Um, yeah. I don't know. What, I see this thing. I don't know what to say about it other than it's, it's a fine film. Marathon Man, John Schlesinger. John Schlesinger. Uh, I love Marathon Man. I really love Roy Scheider in that. I really want his body type. Uh, like, I just want a corpse with in my bed that's his body. No, I wish I was that freaking lean, taut, 0% body fat, look like a skeleton body type. I tried to get that with my thyroid problems, but Lietta said I looked like I was dying. 
Network, uh, Sydney Lumet. Um, good stuff. Go watch it. Whatever. <laughs> I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not taking these pot stickers out of the oven yet. Silent Movie, uh, directed by good old Mel Brooks. Um, I am way overdue for a rewatch of that. Uh, good old John Carpenter's uh, Assault on Precinct 13. Uh, that was one I didn't watch until way into my 30s. Um, I always avoided it, and I don't know why. I just kept putting it off and putting it off. When I finally sat down to watch it, I was really impressed. It's a fine film. <laughs> I keep saying that. That's a fine film. <laughs> a prequel to uh, Assault on Precinct 13 is uh, a Taxi Driver, directed by Martin Scorsese. Or as I call him, Scorsese. Uh, yeah, we could watch it. Don't, don't buy a gun after you watch it. You're going to shoot. And uh, the last of the serious films, of course, probably too artsy for even mentioning on the show. Um, probably too esoteric, metaphysical, you know, like, I feel pretentious even saying this out loud. Master of the Flying Guillotine, uh, directed by Jimmy Wang Yu. Um, <laughs> speaking of movies, I have seen and I would die to rewatch right now. I am so jonesing for some guillotine action. Hopefully that list uh, was more interesting to you uh, than it was to me because we got to get to the good stuff now, boy. We are going to 1976 horror movies. Finally, this is a huge piece of paper. This is like eight and a half by 11 inches of writing. So look out world. Just to help you understand, the other two pieces of paper I was reading off of were 8.5 by 11 inches as well. So we're going to go alphabetically here until I don't. Uh, we're going to go with the first one. Alice, Sweet Alice, directed by Alfred Soule, who I didn't know directed one of my favorite slapstick horror comedies, Pandemonium. I had no idea he did that. Um, Alice, Sweet Alice is uh, just that American giallo goodness is so different. It is so unique. Tonally, it's just unlike anything else out there from the time. So if you haven't seen that, man, get that done. This is weird. Next up is Burnt Offerings by Dan Curtis, a movie that scared the bejeebas out of me as a kid. I love Burnt Offerings. Um, the cellophane is still on the Blu-ray, and I don't know why I'm overdue for a rewatch of that. Um, I should have put this next one on the list, the boring list, because it's just Carrie, directed by Brian De Palma. And, you know, Carrie is wonderful. Carrie Frankenstein is a cool person. But, yeah, Carrie is one of those movies I was down on for a really long time because I got mad. Don't know why. Maybe it was my small TV. I got really mad at Brian De Palma's uh, split-screen shit in that movie, and <laughs> I've since come around to it. <laughs> I think, uh, like, 3D. I don't like 3D. And I kind of don't like split screen stuff. I think it's annoying. It's neat, but I don't like it. I'm weird. Uh, next up is uh, Haunts, directed by Herb Freed. Uh, Haunts is one of those magnificent uh, movies you find on the budget compilations all the time. It's one of those, is she crazy, is she not, how crazy is she, oops, she's crazy movies. Uh, but it is just so sleepy and so strange. Uh, the main lady in it, I forget her name, she is just this strange, strange woman who doesn't seem to know where she is. I mean, maybe she's acting, I don't know. But yeah, check out Haunts so you can find it, it's good. Now I put a sad face in my notes, see? Right there, that's the sad face. Uh, this is a movie I used to really love, and then Jeffrey and I covered it on the Doom Show, and now I mention it because it's something I like, but it's just too sleazy even for me. And I'm a sleazy guy, as everyone will tell you. Werewolf Woman, directed by Reno Di Silvestro. I remembered the rape revenge part. Not remembering how brutal the rape part was, just the revenge. Yeah, I kind of don't like this movie anymore, but it's so ridiculous. The dubbing is some of my favorite uh, Italian dubbed movies. It's so beautiful. Uh, so yeah, Werewolf Woman, just go into it knowing it's really trashy. Okay. The fact that 
Michael Pataki directed a horror movie is something that feels like forbidden knowledge. It's too good for humans to know it, but yet I know it. I'm talking, of course, about the eye trauma classic, Mansion of the Doomed. A movie with so much eye trauma, I think Fulci would be like, hey, could you tone it down, Senor Pataki, please? <laughs> Senore? <laughs> Oh man, Mansion of the Doomed, I, that needs a Blu-ray at some point. It's uh, I have the crappy uh, full frame, way too dark. You have to turn all the lights out in the house to watch uh, Mansion of the Doomed. But it is, if you're creeped out by eyeball shit, like eyeball violence, get away from that movie. But it's great. What happens to Nancy and Sheila in the Mansion of the Doomed is so horrifying, we can't even hint at it on this radio station. Mansion of the Doomed is so shocking, it will never appear on television. Some films you see, some you feel. Uh, next up is uh, Satan's Slave by uh, good old Norman J. Warren. Um, this is a sleepy, satanic cult movie. It is really 70s as hell. It feels like it was made earlier than 76 and sat on a shelf. I don't know if it did or not, uh, but I highly recommend you check out Satan's Slave. Uh, next up on the list is The Town That Dreaded Sundown, directed by Charles B. Pierce. I kept putting this movie off, and I don't know why. I think it was because I couldn't find a DVD of it. And it was uh, one of those movies I finally broke down and downloaded and was very surprised. Very, very surprised by it. It is um, very interesting. <laughs> Charles B. Pierce, he really had a way about him. Um, of course, he always reminds me of uh, S.F. Brownrigg, except there's less uh, sweating and shouting in his movies. But for some reason, those two directors always stuck in my mind. Um, I, I did enjoy the remake or the uh, which who's it? Why don't reboot, fake sequel, real sequel that they made of it of the same title? Uh, but the original is just um, it's weird. It's really weird. A Whisper in the Dark, directed by Marcello Alaprandi. Uh, this is a movie that really doesn't get enough love. Um, it's kind of a movie where nothing happens in it. Uh, I love movies like that. It's uh, very gothic, ghosty. Uh, is the kid possessed? Does he? Ju is the kid evil? Does he have a uh, an entity following him? Is it his imaginary friend? What is going on in the movie? Who cares? It's Italian. It's great. Cannot recommend A Whisper in the Dark enough. Hopefully somebody else will put it out because I know that the, uh, I think it's the No Shame, they put it out and they're long gone. That company's out of here. Uh, maybe somebody out there is selling their Whisper in the Dark DVD for cheap. Speaking of whispering in the dark, and by whispering I mean screaming, and by in the dark I mean with an alligator, Eaten Alive, directed by good old Toby Hooper, or Tuber, as we call him on this show. Uh, Eaten Alive is, man, just bizarre. I, I would love to see this one show up on Joe Bob and have him talk about it with some trivia. That'd be fun. Maybe he has. I don't know. I never saw that episode, but I'd love to. And, uh, yeah. I don't know what else to say about it. It's, uh, it's just so... Tuber. Speaking of the Italians, man, this is one of the massive movies. Oh, this is like kind of the best thing on my whole list. If you like it, it's called The House with the Laughing Windows, directed by Poopy Avati. I love Poopy. I don't mind saying so out loud with people hearing me. Uh, but yeah, House of Laughing Windows... Um, another film that desperately needs a Blu-ray. Everyone seems confused as to where the Blu-ray is. It just is missing from the world, and we need it. Okay. Let's get some Paul Nashio. So, 1976, Paul Nashi with uh, director Leon Klimovsky did a movie called The People Who Own the Dark. Uh, this is a film that gets better with every viewing. Um, I thought it was okay the first time I saw it, uh, but the second viewing really clicked with me. 
and it has stuck with me. It is a very dark film. It's like one of the darkest films in this whole list. It's really, really um, nihilistic and, and really restores your faith in humanity. Uh, I highly recommend if you haven't seen The People Who Own the Dark. It shows you that when the chips are down, people will unite and be good to each other. Very soon, there will be nothing between you and the people who own the dark. Speaking of creatures from the Black Lake, Creature from Black Lake, 1976. Oh, wait, these are all 1976. I don't have to say that. Uh, John N. Houck Jr. I uh, really like this film, uh, mainly for its heroes. The two dudes running around. Of course, one of the dudes being Pahu, um, who really just, he loves hamburgers and he loves chasing ladies. It's a ridiculous movie as only the 70s can do, where they're hunting a freaking Yeti or whatever, and it's more of a buddy film than it is actually about the monster. It's perfect. Man, getting to the end of the not runner-up list. I have a very large runner-up list, which I'll run through pretty quickly since I've been talking for 900 hours. But Jess Franco, who would have thought that Jess Franco would have made a movie in a year? Isn't that weird? It's actually uh, one of his closest to a giallo he made. He made uh, Night of the Assassins, or Night of the Assassin, I forget the title. Uh, but this one is uh, Silence of the Tomb, which uh, I remember finally getting a decent copy of it and going, damn, this feels like a giallo, what the hell? And uh, yeah, so Silence of the Tomb, if you can find it, uh, check it out, it's really good. I managed to actually get um, the... What was that company that kept disappointing everybody? Oh, no. What were they called? They put out the Jess Franco double feature. They put out that Jose Ramon Larraz double feature. And then they just kind of stopped putting out stuff. I don't remember the name of the company. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, but yeah, Sounds of the Tomb is it's really solid. Um, it's got a very convoluted plot, as a giallo would have. But of course, it's the 70s and it's Spain. But it's not sexy Franco, which is what I was getting at there. Um, I don't even know if it has any nudity in the version I've seen. I think um, the Spanish version is very tame, as the censors were prone to do. Woo, 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 woo. All right. That's my main list. Let's get into the um, freaking runner-up. So I got a lot of runner-up movies. Uh, some of these movies I need to watch again. And uh, there's at least one on here that I need to see for the first time so that's a thing anyway i guess i guess if i've never seen a film i can't technically call it a favorite but here's my runner-up list uh we got obsession uh we got uh the premonition uh death weekend rape scene notwithstanding uh the clown murders again rape scene notwithstanding uh dark august speaking of that me generation crap and a movie where nothing really happens um, then there's God Told Me To. Uh, I think it's a Larry Cohen movie. I have seen God Told Me To, but it was so long ago, it might as well be a first time watch. So I'm looking forward to revisiting God Told Me To. Drive In Massacre almost made the list of my favorites, but I need to rewatch it because I know it starts strong, gets really slow, and then I think it ends kind of strong. I forget. I remember enjoying parts of it very much, so I'm willing to give it another go. Grizzly, which is a fine, fine film. There's that phrase again. Grizzly's hilarious. Did not expect it to be as good as it was. Everyone was talking it up, and I just figured, no way, this is going to be as good as they say. Grizzly's pretty amazing. Jess Franco back again with uh, Jack the Ripper. His Jack the Ripper is very strange and very odd, as Franco is wont to do. Uh, and I really need to see it again. I remember enjoying it for what it was. Um, it's Franco. Schizo from Pete Walker. I've never seen this, and I feel that's uh, a crime. I will watch Schizo, I promise. Pair Schizo with another Pete Walker joint called The Confessional, a.k.a. House of Mortal Sin. The reason this is runner-up is because I barely remember it, though I do... I recall enjoying it quite a bit. Here's one that I am confident is bad, called Devil's Kiss, uh, by Jordi Gigo, or Gijo, or G -G -G -G. 
Yes, Devil's Kiss is very silly. It's uh, one of the strangest movies. It might have the lowest IMDb rating out of everything I've mentioned. Um, it's barely a movie, and it's real stupid. Uh, I can't believe... I think it's Kino. Lorber put out the Blu-ray. <laughs> I had to get it. I have that Blu-ray. I think it's a redemption by way of Kino. And man, I just... It's so freaking weird. <laughs> it's real stupid. And uh, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll end on a weird note. Uh, last freaking movie on my entire list here is uh, Land of the Minotaur, a.k.a. The Devil's Men, directed by Kostas Karagianis. And uh, another really strange one, but that has the cloaks, the lots of men in multicolored cloaks. Some of those cloaks were black. Some of those men tried to steal me when I was born, and when they fled the country, after the manhunt for them went on, they went to Greece and made a movie. Uh, Land of the Minotaur, Donald Pleasance, not knowing what the fuck he's doing there. It's great. And uh, I remember the, um, the main hero in the movie, his really huge hair. And that's the way it was. July 4th, 1976, America's 200th anniversary. This is Walter Cronkite, CBS News. Good night. Okay, let's get to those people who were kind enough to write in to the show. I got a big list here. From my pals, I put out the word. I said, send me your three to five favorite movies from your birth year. Scott of EuroCultAV.com, he said, my birth year was 1982, so I can go on for a while. Uh, but he picked Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, Blade Runner, The Thing, Pieces, and Tenebre. These are all excellent choices, sir. Especially uh, Wrath of Khan. I finally rewatched uh, the, I guess, the first five Star Trek movies. Maybe the first four. I forget. It was wonderful. Wrath of Khan is, oh man, beautiful. Next up is our pal Christian Bates Hardy. He says, This is going to be tough. 1985 was an amazing year in film in general, but sticking to just horror. Uh, my top five is, uh, number one, uh, Reanimator, number two, Phenomena, number three, Fright Night, number four, Demons, and of course, number five, Return of the Living Dead. Uh, some honorable mentions, uh, Cemetery of Terror, which is amazing, uh, Day of the Dead, Life Force, much love for Life Force from me, uh, A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2, Freddy's Dead, and of course, the Mutilator, aka Fall Break, masterpiece. Uh, Christian says, 1985 was also the year of Back to the Future, which is still one of my favorite films of all time, and The Goonies, which will always be a nostalgic favorite of mine. Thank you, sir. Those are excellent. My bud, uh, Carrie Frankenstein, uh, she wrote in with the phrase, 1991, dot, dot, dot. Um, yeah. Huh. I don't know what I was pausing for there. Uh, but she said her favorites are The Sounds of the Lambs, uh, People Under the Stairs, Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey, and of course, Dragon Ball Z, Cooler's Revenge. Which, um, I think that's the first film in all of these people's lists that I have never seen. Um, I need to get on this Dragon Ball chain. Dragon Balls Z. Uh, next up, we have an audio message. Our our pal uh, Paul the Shy Yeti himself uh, sent an audio message. Let's listen to it. Hi, Richard. It's me, Paul Shy Yeti from the Shadows Podcast. Um, my year of birth is 1973. Now, that's quite a big year because you've got things like The Exorcist, Don't Look Now. Uh, I particularly like that because I love Venice, Wicker Man. But the, my favourites are perhaps the slightly more obscure ones. The House That Vanished, um, Iron Rose, um, Dan Curtis's Night Strangler, Turn of the Blind Dead. Uh, then there's the anthology films like Tales of Witness Madness and Vaulter of Horror. Uh, I, I do love those. But probably my number two would probably be Theatre of Blood, uh, which I, I really come back to a lot. But my, my absolute favourite, my number one, uh, we'll, we'll, is one that I only discovered, you know, in the last 10 years, 
and that is Torso, which, you know, is part slasher, part Alfred Hitchcock, and, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's definitely my number one from 1973. Okay. Well, thank you, sir. I, I like some of the uh, titles you were throwing around there. Of course, Torso, Magnificent Film. Um, I've been a little down on the, uh, the, the blind dead movies for a while, just because I don't like when filmmakers reuse the footage and, uh, De Osorio would reuse the footage from the first fricking blind dead movie and all of the blind dead movies. I was stuck in my craw a little bit, but I'm a big fan of the American cut, uh, the American dub, especially of good old tombs of the blind dead. And uh, Return of the Blind Dead is good, if I am remembering. Always glad to hear from you, sir. So moving on to our people who wrote to me. Uh, we got Amy Green, our pal, our friend. She's coming at me with, in her words, that 1976 bombness with uh, House of the Laughing Windows. Surreal Estate, which I have to look up in a second. I have no idea what that is. Uh, Drive-In Massacre. Seven Women for Satan, and Whisper in the Dark. So I think I have no idea what surreal estate is. I have a feeling I'm going to be schooled here. Eduardo Di Gregorio. Gregorio. It is a drama. Leslie Caron. Corin Redgrave. No idea. This sounds fun. I will watch this at some point. And uh, seven, seven Women for Satan... Pardon my slow typing. This is one I thought I'd seen, but I believe I'm mixing it up with another film. Something that Scott McDonald and I talked about. Scott, what was the movie you and I talked about? Hello? Scott's not here. But yes, I want to see Seven Women for, Seven Women for Satan. I saw that uh, Mondo Macabro has put out a new Blu-ray? Or they put out a Blu-ray for the first time? I'm not sure. But excellent list. I love having a a twinsy and especially love hearing more about A Whisper in the Dark. I love that movie. Simon, our pal Simon, co-host of the show. He says 1984 in no particular order. Footloose, 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 footloose. And he said, OK, let's do this properly. Uh, not ranked as it's too difficult. Friday the 13th, the final chapter. Uh, Ghostbusters. Night of the Comet, A Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, Repo Man, and uh, one honorable mention, as it is Christmas, Don't Open Till Christmas, another great year for movies, and I could have picked ten or more. Our a friend of the show, Ted Rawson, wrote in. He said, I've got 1982, so it's so for horror, it's uh, Friday, the, the Friday Part 3, uh, come help me. Friday the 13th, part three, the 3D one, uh, Tenebre, uh, Halloween, three pieces, and of course, um, The Thing as his number one. Very good choices. Uh, and he also really likes in the non horror genre is uh, The Last Unicorn, Fast Times at Ridgemont High, and Tron. Although that could have been Fast Times at Jupiter High. That's where I went to high school. Curtis Radon. I hope I'm saying your name right, sir. I hope it's not Radoon. So Curtis wrote in. He said he's got 1983. And he has Uncommon Valor, Sudden Impact, The Dead Zone, and Sleepaway Camp. Lovely. Now, which one is Uncommon Valor? Because I suspect I have not seen that. Oh, okay. So it's directed by Ted Kotcheff. And it is with uh, Gene Hackman, Robert Stack, Fred Ward, ooh, Red Brown, Patrick Swayze, and of course, the Trancers Hunter himself, Tim Thomerson. You know, as a kid, I used to rent all of the frickin' uh, Vietnam movies, but I think I missed Uncommon Valor. I would definitely watch this. And uh, Sudden Impact, that's the Dirty Harry movie, right? I don't know why I don't remember that. Yes, Sudden Impact. Uh, that one I... I'm sure I've seen, I've seen all of them, all of them Harry's, all the Harry ones. But thanks for writing in, uh, Curtis. Good to hear from you. Uh, the Doomed Show's own, Jeffrey. He said, uh, They Live, Beetlejuice, Miracle Mile, which is also um, a very 
triple X erotic movie, very horny movie, uh, Heathers, Lady in White, Andy included some Doom Show faves also released in his birth year, Ghost House, Witchery, and Edge of the Axe. I can never call Witchery a favorite because that that horrific rape scene, but <laughs> Witchery is very special. Uh, My buddy Goose from the It Came From The Shed podcast wrote in, and he said, Cemetery Man, Pumpkinhead 2 Blood Wings, which I've still never seen. That's a big one on on my uh, unseen list. It looks incredible. Uh, He also says In the Mouth of Madness, which is a favorite, and Serial Mom, another big favorite of mine. I don't want to know if someone doesn't love Serial Mom. That movie's too great. Um, next up is our buddy, Travis Linthicum. Hello, Travis. Travis sent 54321. He said, uh, Friday the 13th, part five, a new beginning, uh, Fright Night, Phenomena, Demons. There's that Demons again. And again, Return of the Living Dead. Man, you guys like to be depressed. I think, um, I think Miracle Mile and Return of the Living Dead are both about relationships. Uh, so Math- Matthew Tangen of the Bad, the Weird, and the Cheesy podcast wrote in, and he said, there are quite a few great films that came out in good old 1979. A few of the ones I have a real connection to are, uh, number one, he has Alien. He says, this is the best sci-fi horror film. The Black Hole, I saw this when I was younger, didn't get it because it's weird as hell, but I loved it. Uh, the Jerk, he said, and this is number three, The Jerk. Do I need a reason? No, sir, you do not. Uh, The Jerk is wonderful. Uh, Phantasm, number four here. Again, confusing as hell, but also scary as shit. Here we go. His number five. Apocalypse Now. It's a horror slash war movie that definitely unsettled me when I saw it far too young. LOL. Now, Matthew, I have revisited The Black Hole. (laughs) Which... Sounds good. And I liked what I saw. No, I really love The Black Hole. The movie's great. Uh, Then we heard from our buddy Mark. He said, here's my three favorites, uh, my three favorite movies from 1975. He said, Eyeball, Mary, Mary, Bloody Mary, and Race with the Devil, which are all great choices. I am really a big Eyeball fan, but uh, Mary, Mary, Bloody Mary. I regret um, I've still never seen this. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, boy. The artwork is great. Oh, it's uh, Juan Lopez Montezuma. He, uh, I believe he's the dude who did Alucarda, right? Yes. He's the Alucarda guy. I had no idea that he directed this, and I must see it. Holy crap. Thank you, Mark. I will bump that up. Yes. Oh, my buddy Tom Wilson. Tom wrote in and said, he's kind of spoilt for cheese from 82, but I think it goes. And I'm assuming that uh, spoilt for cheese is a euphemism about how tall he's a very tall man. I think Tom Wilson is seven foot, 19 inches tall. He says, number one is the thing. Number two, Friday the 13th in 3D and number three pieces. Man, I love you guys loving pieces. Oh, love it. Finally, the last person who wrote to us, to me, to you, is uh, freaking Brad, Doom Show's own Brad. He says his five favorite movies from his birth year are the Frank Langella Dracula, uh, which I've, I think I've gotten him on Blu-ray twice now. We'll see if he gets another upgrade. It might be thrice. Um, he also loves Tourist Trap. Yes, we all love Tourist Trap. Brilliant. Uh, Salem's Lot. <clears throat> Hello, Salem's Lot. Uh, there's Toby Hooper sneaking in again. The Jerk, another vote for The Jerk as a favorite birth movie. I love it. And last but not least, Lucio Fulci's Zombie or Zombie 2 or Zombie Flesh Eaters. Awesome, you guys. This is a fine list. And you know what? That Dracula with Frank Langella, man, what the hell? It is so good. It is one of those movies that I remember seeing and then just forgot it existed for a long time. But Brad made sure I remembered it, and I'm glad he did because it's wonderful. As always, folks, if you want to run right, if you want to write into hello, this is the Doom Show. It's doomedmoviethon at gmail dot com, and yeah, if you want to just write in just to say hi, go for it. 
If you really want something read aloud, like your manifesto, or just, you know, whatever you want to say, let me know. Just say, hey, I want this read on the air, and I'll do it. Thank you, folks. Thank you for tuning in to all that craziness. I want to thank all the people who wrote in. You guys are amazing. I really appreciate feedback, and I love when you folks contribute to these solo episodes. And I am glad that this 2020 year is almost done, boy, as everybody is feeling it. It's the most generic statement of the year. Gosh, I wish this year would end. Like, no kidding. But here's some other stuff going on with me. Giallo Meltdown Volume 2 has started. The book has officially begun. I'm going to be uh, writing Chapter 4 very soon. Um, I've had a blast writing the first three chapters so far. How long will this book be? Um, I don't know. I'm hoping for the same length as Giallo Meltdown Volume 1. Maybe even longer. That'd be fine. I got tons of films. So expect an update on that someday. But nothing soon, I promise. I've also been working on music a lot. Uh, My band hasn't really slowed down. We've been able to sneak in some uh, socially distanced recording and make sure we stay safe while we rock. So Gyro Jets will have new material very soon. We've got really cool shit in the mix. Um, literal pieces of poop in the recordings. It's great. Um, I finished an album, which I'm going to close out with today. I'm going to play an excerpt. I did an album called uh, No Catnip for... No, excuse me. I already forgot the name of my album. It's No Catnip Before Catnap. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to make an album to help people relax. I listen to a lot of really cool 80s new age music. Uh, Take the phrase really cool out of there and you have the truth. Um, I love old synthesizers and I love soothing music for taking naps to. And I so I tried to emulate those types of albums with just guitar and guitar pedals. I didn't use any of my keyboard stuff. And it's just my guitar. I mixed it and added reverb and made it pretty. At least I think it's pretty. But I'll play you a little sampling at the end of this show so you can hear what I've been up to when I'm not actually doing what I'm supposed to be doing, which is editing this podcast. In January, I'm going to try to start off the year right uh, with uh, 1982 Slashers with Brad. Um, Don't let uh, Madman fool you. I firmly believe that Madman is not a 1981 slasher. It is a 1982 slasher. Don't listen to the the haters. Anyway, it's going to be Brad and I talking about slasher movies. And then who knows what's going to come after that. It's going to be great. But that'll be the first proper episode of 2021. Man, uh, Merry Holidays, if you're feeling it. If you're one of those people who dreads the holiday season, just ignore that sentence. And uh, freaking take care of yourselves. And uh, if you want to shoot the shit, doomedmoviethon at gmail.com. Uh, go to the Facebook group. It's the Doomed Moviethon Multiverse. Come say hi. Be a friend. Be a pal. And we'll hang. And uh, yeah, I'm going to get going. I have Christmas specials to watch. Liet is very patiently waiting for me. I have two app updates available, which I need to get on. So go update your apps. Merry Christmas to your... Hanukkah apps. Download the Kwanzaa feature. Have a time. Bye.
Although This is the Doom Show is a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network. Please check out the other podcasts on legionpodcasts.com. If you'd like more Hello, This is the Doom Show, go to hellodoomshow.podomatic.com or go to doomedmoviethon.com for the archives. If that's still not enough, go to at doomedmoviethon on Twitter. You can write in to Hello, This is the Doom Show, use the email doomedmoviethon at gmail.com. Doom Show episodes are available on record and 8-track cassette. If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcasts, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Mental Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick 6 Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which vs. the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet.